Well, good morning, New Hope. Morning. We're coming to the place now where we are finally finished with Jesus' last teachings on his last day to his disciples. The words that we're going to look at today are those very last, last words. We've been in a sermon series entitled The Means and the Measures of Maturity. The Means and the Measures of Maturity. And the reason we've entitled it that is because Jesus has to take his disciples who are very immature in their faith, very weak in their faith, and bring them to the place where they can become world changers. And they'll have a very short time to do it. This is the last day of his life. So this is the last words of a man who's about to die. And our text picks up this week in John chapter 16, verse 29. And in this text, Jesus will leave them with these final thoughts. Thoughts on faith, fear, and hope. Thoughts on faith, fear, and hope. And his text opens up this way. Our text opens up this way. It's with the disciples speaking, and they say this in verse 29. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Can I ask you something? Have you ever experienced a time in your life, a, a moment perhaps in your life, a moment of clarity in which something that you generally already believed suddenly became so clear to you, so real to you, that in that moment it was almost like it was new, almost like it was exciting. It was a confirmation of that which you already had accepted. And the realization of the fact that it is indeed based in truth. This is not just some, some whimsical thinking. This is not just, just wishful thinking. This is, this is absolutely true. And in that moment, it was like, yes, it's clear now. See, that is exactly what the disciples had experienced here. It's not that they didn't believe in Jesus before. Oh, they believed. But this was like a, 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 a revelation moment to them. And we have those moments in our lives. This was to the disciples the realization of reality. The realization of the reality they had already accepted, but now they saw it in a new way. And they said to him, now we know that you know all things. What does that mean? Well, to, to say that Jesus knows all things is to say that he's omniscient. In other words, it's another way of saying he's God. He'd been with them for so many years. They'd seen him do miracles. They'd seen him read their own minds, know their thoughts. And now, the way he'd been explaining things in this recent chapter, now it was just reaffirmed to them with clarity that he really is who he says he is. It's a confirmation of what they already accepted. But now they were just rock solid in it. You know all things. In other words, you're God. Now we get it. You are God. And by the way, this is the foundation. This is the foundation of, of uh, the Christian faith. This is the foundation of the Christian faith, that Jesus is God in human flesh. It all begins there. And then they said, we have, you have no need of anyone to question you. See, no question anyone asked was too difficult for him when they were asking him things. So there's no need for them to ask him any more so, to prove who he is. They, they know. It's obvious. We don't need to ask him any questions. It's obvious who, who he is. So this, this kind of moment of clarity, this kind of revelation for them was a pivotal moment. It was a pivotal moment. A transformational moment, if you will. This was the kind of faith that changed their perspective on reality, resulting in some clear decisions. You know, we all go through those kind of things. We go through uh, different phases of our faith. 
just like they did. Now, I want you to understand that there are different kinds of faith, okay? When, you, when, you, when we say the word faith, we can't just think of one thing because there's different kinds of faith. You say, well, what do you mean different kinds of faith? Well, Scripture says, when you're talking about, well, people say, well, isn't it enough just to believe? Well, Scripture says, even the demons believe and shudder, right? The demons believe. Well, what is it that the demons believe? Well, the demons believe all the truth about God. They believe in His essential character, His nature, who He is. They would give what we would call an intellectual assent to the facts of God. They would say, oh yes, yeah, I know Jesus is God, sure, sure. But that's not the kind of faith we're talking about. James chapter 2, verse 9. Even the demons believe. But this kind of faith was a different kind of faith. This was the kind of faith that actually did something. It's what we call efficacious faith or effectual faith. It's, it's the faith that has a result. And in this case, it would be the result of a changed life. Faith that resulted in justification. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this. <laughs> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. So this is faith that resulted in justification and peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, once you and I fully place our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, when we become convinced that He is who He says He is, and take it even a step farther than being convinced, and here's the critical part, we have to take it a step farther than just being convinced of who He is. The question is, not who is He, but who is He to you? See, we can say all day, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord. Oh yeah, Jesus is God. Well, the demons believe that stuff. The question is, who is He to you? Is He your Lord? What relationship has changed between you and He now that you have come to faith? Have you, have you placed your faith in Him? That's the trick. Do you believe on Him in a faith that results in justification and peace? So, once we enter into that relationship, once that happens, we, something happens to us. We enter into a love relationship with God that is irrevocable. It's irrevocable. Like all true believers, the disciples' faith reached a point of no return. There comes a time... We, we begin to think about Jesus. We begin to ponder, you know, maybe I should check this Jesus guy out. Maybe this makes sense. We start maybe reading our Bible. We start uh, listening to lessons online or something. We find a friend that starts telling us about Scripture. And we start saying, yeah, you know, I, I think this has some credibility. I mean, I think this really has some credence. I, I think Jesus really could be exactly who he says he is. And we start looking at the historical data and the archaeological evidence and the scientific stuff. And we put it all together and we go, well, yeah, this really makes intellectual sense. But that is not faith. Not this kind of faith. That is intellectual assent. But at some point, once we actually give ourselves over to that truth, and that truth has an effect on us, then what happens is we cross a line. We cross a line. At some point in our lives, all of us do, we cross a line, a, a, a point of no return, if you will, in our faith. <laughs> a point at which God would from that point hold on to us, a point from which at that point we are God's. We belong to Him now. We belong to Jesus Christ. We are His. And He holds on to us once we cross that line. Now, these disciples were there. They had faith, and their faith was real. But they didn't know what was coming. They didn't know that Jesus, they didn't fully at least realize that Jesus had to still die. And what was going to happen after that? Now, how horrible that situation is going to be. You know what? You and I are in the same boat. We may have faith, we may have saving faith, but we are living in a world where we do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Your life may be going just great. Everything's for your health is good, your finances are decent, 
your family's okay, you're even getting along with the in-laws, you know, everything's just like, how, how can this be any better? And tomorrow, the bottom may completely drop out of your world. It happens. It happens. They didn't know. They didn't fully realize that Jesus had to go through this death experience. They hadn't quite wrapped their head around that fully. John Calvin said of this passage, they might not have fully understood it, but the mere scent of this truth refreshed them. The fact that they realized Jesus is God. Which brings us to the second point that Jesus makes. That faith, as it's revealed here, is a journey. There's this journey of faith. There's this journey of faith we're on. Now, I didn't used to think like this. I used to think a little more linearly, a little more in the box. But the longer I spend with Jesus, the more I've come to, come to understand that faith is a process. It's a journey. The road to deeper reliance on God is a process, and it's a road that's filled with all kinds of things. It's filled with faith and failures and fear. We all go through those things. My faith today is different than my faith was a year ago. And it's sure different than it was 10 years ago. Now, does that mean I didn't have saving faith 10 years ago? No, of course I did. You bet I did, or 20 years ago, or whatever. But the, but the point is, my faith is different now. It's, a, it's at, a, at a different level, I guess. So we're all growing, if you will, from faith to faith. We're growing in our faith. And faith is a process. Faith is a journey. And we're on the journey of faith together. But there, again, comes some point in your journey of faith where your faith becomes genuine, where it becomes effectual, where it results in something. It results in a changed life. Now, John chapter 16, verse 31, Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Now, I don't know what translation of scripture you have. The different translations uh, may have this a little bit different. Some have, do you believe, question mark. Some translations say, now you believe, period. And if you're wondering why that is, if you're wondering why that is, in Greek, the original language that this scripture was written in, there is no difference between an interrogative and a declarative in sentence structure. And there's no punctuation, there's no question mark. So this passage can rightly be translated either do you now believe question mark or it can also rightly be translated you now do believe now you say well well which one is it well we could go back and forth and and, and talk about what's what but but here's the bottom line i want you to get and regardless regardless of which way we read this the meaning ultimately is the same. The upshot of it ultimately is the same. Imagine a woman speaking to her faithless husband after years of him cheating on her, saying something like, Oh, are you now going to be faithful? See, that can, that can be two ways. It can be a question, or it can be a, oh, are you now going to be faithful? Well, what happens the next time you meet a woman? Right? See, Jesus is about to tell them something. He's about to tell them that they're about to go through some trials that will cause them to leave him alone. Interesting, isn't it? It's a warning he's giving them. John chapter uh, 17, verse 8, says this of them. In case you're wondering about their faith, in case you're thinking, well, maybe their faith isn't real then. John chapter 17, just a few verses past where we are, this is Jesus praying to his Father. He says, For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and they have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Did you catch that? They believed. So Jesus isn't in this passage doubting their faith. Jesus isn't saying, oh, you, you don't really believe. No, he, 
A couple sentences later, maybe 60 seconds after he said this, he's talking to his father saying, yeah, they really believe. What he's saying is, you believe, but you're about to go through something in your life that's going to make you take a step away from me. Now, don't miss this, because you and I go through much the same things in our lives. Sometimes it's to a greater degree, sometimes it's to a lesser degree. Here's the interesting thing. It did not mean that these people abandoned their faith, nor did it mean that they never had faith. They just messed up. Now, they messed up big time, but they messed up nonetheless. The true disciple's courage to follow Christ may falter, but he always swiftly returns. That's how you know a disciple. These guys fled on Friday. They left Jesus alone. They fled on Friday, but on Sunday they were back. And their faith was on fire. See, the more we learn about Jesus, the more strongly we come to believe in Jesus. The more we learn about Jesus, the more strongly we come to believe in Jesus. And they still had some stuff to learn. <laughs> Mark chapter 9, verse 22 says this, and this is, this is an interesting passage because it's about a, a, a father who, who wants to see his son healed. It says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if I can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, and don't miss this part. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. How weird is that? I believe, help my unbelief. What does that even mean? You and I are in that same boat. The disciples were in that same boat. I believe. My belief is genuine. It's real. It's not fake. But I believe, but help my unbelief. See, Because there's a process. There's a journey. I believe. Help my unbelief. That's part of the journey of faith. And the more we learn about Jesus, the more strongly we come to believe in Jesus. Now, that's important for us to remember because we find ourselves often in the same boat that the disciples were. Now, Jesus here will finally leave us with the hope among the hurt. The hope among the hurt. Before his death and resurrection, Jesus' last words to his disciples would come in three parts here. Jesus gives us first a warning to heed, an example to follow, and comfort to cling to. A warning to heed, an example to follow, and a comfort to cling to. Let's begin with the first one, a warning to heed. Jesus begins with this warning of what's to come. He's warning his disciples. He's saying, hey, you're about to go through some nasty stuff. And did you know he says the same, same thing to us? John chapter 16, verse 32a says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Did this mean their faith was fake? No. But he wanted them to know that in this time of fear, they would falter, they would mess up. And we have a tendency to do that too. They genuinely believed. They genuinely believed. And not only did they genuinely believe, they genuinely believed the right thing. Here's where they messed up. Here's where they messed up. They overestimated their own strength and faith. They overestimated their own strength and faith. Peter himself, Peter himself did the same. Luke twenty two thirty one. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go uh, uh, with you uh, both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you denied me three times. 
Isn't that an interesting passage? L- listen to it. Simon, Simon, this is Jesus speaking. Speaking, speaking to Peter. Satan has demanded to have you. In other words, Satan wants you. Satan and I have had a conversation, and he's really intent on you. He's got this whole plan laid out. He's got this whole strategy. He knows all your weaknesses. He wants you. His desire is for you. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Isn't that interesting? I find it fascinating that in this passage, which God the Father answered perfectly, Jesus' prayer. In this prayer, Jesus said, what am I praying? I'm praying that your faith may not fail. And yet, we see Peter deny Jesus three times. And yet, it is true that his faith didn't fail. Isn't that interesting? See, what we're talking about is momentary lapses, momentary failures. We're not talking about a lifestyle now. We're not talking about intentional, deliberate, premeditated, unrepentant choices to walk away from God. We're talking about mess-ups, and we all have those. We all have those. And he says, Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned, when you have turned again, that is fascinating. When you have turned again, come and strengthen your brothers. In other words, when you're done messing up, like you've been messing up, and you got that all out of your system, and you're ready to come back to me and live the way that you know you should live, then I want you to strengthen your brothers. Strengthen those around you who are going through similar things. See, you and I would like to believe that our faith is strong. That our faith is mature. You and I would like to believe that somehow our faith is stronger than Peter's faith. Peter certainly has thought his faith was stronger, more mature than it really was. <clears throat> but here's the good news. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. I love this passage. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. Man. See, God holds on to us even when we are weak. Once we, once we actually really become believers, once we actually cross that line where faith becomes real, where Jesus really is our Lord and Savior, where we really actually have a relationship with Him, from that point on, it's game over. From that point on, He holds on to us. And when we are faithless, He is faithful. God holds on to us even when we're weak. Faithless disciples, these were. Faithless disciples. In some sense. Immature. Now, if you look at this, this passage here, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. A good question would be to ask, what does faithless mean? Faithless describes an immature believer. Oh, he's a believer, all right. I mean, he's saved, he's going to heaven, everything's done, but he's immature. And there's times in his life where he loses track of what's really important and starts living for himself rather than for Christ. But even when believers fail, Jesus remains lawyer. Christ never forsakes his own. Never. But right about at this point, where we are being comforted with this passage, I want to stop for a moment and I want to give you a warning. Okay? And I don't want you to miss it. I want to give you a very sober warning. Here. Hear me on this. There is a mistake that many of us make, and it's most often made by young believers. Like, Peter was a young believer. Oh, I'll never, I'll never. If everybody else falls away, I'll never, I'll never deny you. Here's a mistake that young believers often make. And that is overestimating our own faith and strength. 
overestimating our own faith and strength. And the conversation in our head goes something like this. Well, look, I get that I'm supposed to be a Christian. I get that I'm supposed to be separate and apart and different. But come on, I'm living in the world. And besides, I want to have kind of some influence on people around me, right? And so I don't want to be some weird monk and go to some monastery or become Amish or something like that. So, yeah, I get that. So, so you know what? I, I, I got to kind of immerse myself in stuff. And so, listen, I can get into this stuff because, after all, I can handle it. I'm strong. I can handle it. I get that other people have fallen away doing this stuff, but, but I can handle it. So the question, then, that we have to start asking ourselves is, how long do you think you can continue to stand while handling it? How close can you get to the fire before you're burned? How long can you stand when you continue to hang out with nobody else but worldly friends and listen to mostly worldly music? And speak worldly language and watch worldly movies and think worldly thoughts. Like, how long do you think? See? That's why Jesus said, listen, you, you, you guys are all, you guys are all going to follow. You guys are going to leave me alone. I'm not saying you're losing your salvation. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm just saying, you guys are going to be really ineffective here. Okay? And some of us, there's a couple places we can be in our lives. We can be at the place where we think we're Christians, but we're just fooling ourselves. We're not really saved. We don't really have any kind of relationship with the Lord. We don't really love Him. And we know that because those who love Him keep His commandments. So that's the desire of our life. So we can be in that point where, where we fooled ourselves because we have an intellectual assent to the facts. We might even know our Bible really well. Oh, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. Sure, I believe, yeah, I believe he died. I believe he rose. Yeah, sure, all that doesn't make a Christian at all. Demons believe that. We may be at that place. The other place where we may be is we may be a Christian and our faith has become effective. We actually have faith, not just a faith about, but faith in Christ. We've placed our faith and our life in Christ and we are actually saved and going to heaven. But the devil is about the business of making us ineffective. If he can ruin our thoughts, and he can ruin our witness, well then, yeah, I guess they'll get to heaven by the skin of their teeth, but ah, they're not going to do any good here. Right? So that's another place we can be. We don't want to be in either of those places. We want to be effective. We want to be effective for the kingdom. That's important. And then, and then, not only, not only does he give us a warning to heed, but secondly, he gives us an example to follow. Verse 32, the second part of verse 32, Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. See this passage right here? If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest ye fall. You know who this is talking to, this passage? You know who this passage is directed to? It's directed to people who think they are standing. Isn't that interesting how that works? It's directed to people who think they've got it all together. I'm not going to fall. Therefore, anyone who thinks he stands, take heed. Take heed lest ye fall. Don't be foolish. Don't think you've got it all together. Don't think, oh, not me. That's crazy. <coughs> Now, Jesus will give us an example to follow. He says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. You see that? He says, listen, you guys are going to all leave me. Not one of you is going to be around. You'll all scatter to the wind. I'm going to be alone. But actually, I'll never be alone. <laughs> and the reason I'll never be alone is because my Father is always with me. Jesus knew that all of his friends would abandon him. And even if they did, his father would still be there. You ever been in a place in your life where you felt like everybody has abandoned you? Maybe a spouse. Maybe a mother or a father. Maybe a brother or a sister. Maybe a boss. Maybe a close friend. They've just 
Things got tough and they ran for the hills. In those times, Jesus gives us an example. Yeah, you, you, you may leave me alone. I'm not alone. My Father is with me. And you know Jesus makes to us the same promise. Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or forsake you. Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Same promises. Never going to leave us. So no matter what your friends do, no matter what's going on in your family, no matter what the hardship is you're going through, Jesus is always with you. The Lord is always with you. So he gives us an example to follow. A warning to heed, an example to follow, and thirdly, a comfort to cling to. A comfort to cling to. And these will be the very last of his very last words to them. A comfort to cling to. He then concludes with a wonderful promise. A wonderful promise. And by the way, this passage that we're about to read is probably one of the most beautiful, one of the most encouraging, one of the most comforting passages in all the Bible. And it goes like this, verse 33. I have said these things to you. What things? The things he's been talking about for the last chapter. I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. See, that's a rare commodity nowadays. Peace. That in me you may have peace. Why? Well, because in the world you're going to have tribulation. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Now, what is peace? When we read this passage... And we see, uh, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. What, what, what kind of peace? I mean, what is this peace he's talking about? Peace in knowing that God loves you with an undying love. That you have a Savior who's paid the price for your sin. You have a Holy Spirit living inside you that is your guide and your protector and your provider. Peace... Regardless of the circumstances. And here's the beauty of it. See, most of us think of peace in the wrong way. Most of us think of peace as a mere cessation of violence. Most of us think of, of peace more like a, like a ceasefire, you know? We stop firing at each other so there's a peace at the moment. But tomorrow we're going to start back up. This isn't the peace he's talking about. He doesn't give the kind of peace that the world gives. He gives the peace that passes understanding. He gives the peace, catch it, the peace that is there and strong regardless of whatever is happening around you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what your, what your finances look like. Or the fact that you just got that horrible diagnosis from the doctor. Or the fact that, that your uh, family is in turmoil. Or the fact that you just lost your job. Or, or None of those things affect this kind of peace. This is a peace that passes understanding. This, this is a peace that is beyond circumstances. In the midst of the world's pain and mess, which by the way, he promises. That's a promise. That's a promise. In this world, you will have trouble, okay? It's all kinds of promises like that. In this world, you will have trouble. Anyone who wants to come after me is going to be persecuted. Anyone who is my follower is going to be hated by the world. All kinds of promises to stand on, okay? But this is also a promise. You're going to have peace because I've overcome the world. Jesus doesn't promise the removal of trials when you become a believer. He doesn't do that. In fact, he tells you right up front, hey, by the way, this is going to get ugly. Just letting you know. Just saying. He acknowledges that there's suffering and pain. But he promises to take that pain and turn it into joy. What does it mean when he says he's overcome the world? What is the world? Well, the, the Greek word here is, is cosmos. Which refers to the, 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 the system of this world. The power of this world, who's, by the way, largely under the control of Satan. Scripture calls uh, Satan the god of this world. Okay? He who does not gather with me scatters. Okay? So the world is under the domination and influence of, of Satan. 
And he says, but I've overcome all that. Like I, this is game over. I, I've overcome all this. I've overcome the world. So regardless of how the world is going, regardless of how your life is going right now, in the end, you win because Jesus wins. That's the beauty of it. You win because He wins. So, let's finish out this way. Maybe you are in a position where you truly do believe in Jesus. Like you're a genuine follower of Christ. It's not just that you give intellectual assent to the facts. You actually have like given your life to Jesus. You say, I'm yours, I'm all in. Okay. And maybe you're there right now. But trials in your life and doubts in your life and fears in your life and pain in your life and failure in your life have caused you to doubt. have caused you to wonder if you can really trust God. Can I really trust this God? Can I really hand over the, the reins? Can I really give over the control of my life to Him? What's it going to look like if I do? Can I really trust Him? Can I really trust Him with my plans? Can I trust Him with my future? Can I trust Him with my happiness? <laughs> And you're wondering, you're, you're in that place, and you're wondering if this is a, a God that you can trust. Jesus is saying here by these, these words, when the world's crumbling around you and when your life is a mess and everybody that you thought was good failed you, I am here and I've never let you go. Trust me. Trust me. Because Jesus brings hope among the hurt. Some of us find this hard to believe, and the reason we find it hard to believe goes something like this. You know, I get what the Bible says about how much God loves people. I get that. And I get that He has this wonderful plan, and that He died for people and all that, and, and, and that's great, and I do really believe all that stuff, but I think that I'm really kind of an exception to the rule. I mean, I get that God loves people, but I don't think He loves me. Because me, I messed up. And, and, and if anybody just knew the thoughts I think, and if anybody knew the mistakes I made, and if anybody knew the things that I've done, and not just the things that I've done, but the things I keep on doing that are the same stupid mistakes that I did years ago, and I'm still doing them now, and I can never learn. If anybody knew how ugly I really was, they'd never love me. I get that God loves people in general, but me? No, that's, that's different, see. Mary was a young girl in the 50s. Young girl in the 50s. and When she was born, she was born with some birth defects. She was born with a cleft palate. She was born with... Uh, misshaped lips and crooked nose, garbled speech, couldn't hear it all out of one ear. And as she was a young little girl in pony ponytails running around, she, even at that age, learned real quick that she was different. I mean, she knew the other kids had problems too, but not like Mary. And she daily bore the brunt of the jokes and the stares of the cruel kids. You know how ki cruel kids can be. And they just teased her nonstop because like what else are you going to do, right? And she began to realize to herself that you know what? I, I am just, while other people are messed up, I am beyond messed up. I'm, I'm a whole new level of messed up. And nobody could really love me. I mean, I get, you know, my, my mom and dad might love me, but nobody outside my family could ever love me. I, I'm just a joke. My life is a failure. You, you talk about looking in the mirror and experiencing self-doubt. I mean, I mean that's, that's Mary. And then one day, 
she walked into Mrs. Leonard's class. New teacher. And the teacher greeted her students with a warm smile. She was a compassionate, loving lady. So nice, in fact, that all the kids liked Mary, or liked uh, Mrs. Leonard. But, but Mary <laughs> came to love Mrs. Leonard. Not just like her, she came to love her. In the 50s, it was very common at that time for kids in school to have hearing tests done by their teachers. And the way the hearing test would work is they would plug one ear. The teacher had the kid plug one ear completely. And a, a part of this hearing test, there were several parts of it, but part of it is you plug one ear, and the teacher whispers in the other ear, very faint, very faint, whispers in the ear, to see if that ear's working. And then she does the same with the other ear. And usually things that people, well, that the teachers would say would be a, a simple line that the kid could repeat, something like, the sky is blue, or the dog runs fast. And the teacher would whisper this in their ear while the kid plugged the other ear. But Mary figured out how to beat this test. She was completely deaf in one ear, but she figured out how to beat the test. And she'd done it for years. What she did is instead of putting her hand over her ear, she kind of slightly cupped her hand so she could hear with the good ear while the teacher was testing the bad ear. And on this day... Mary was doing the very same thing as the teacher was about to speak into her bad, deaf ear. She cupped her hand, listened, and the words that the teacher said changed Mary's life. It changed her forever. It changed the way she sees the world and sees herself. It changed who she became, changed everything. The words that the teacher spoke into her ear ever so quietly, with her hand on her shoulder, in this gentle, gentle whisper, it wasn't, it wasn't the sky is blue. It wasn't the dog runs fast. Mrs. Leonard leaned over to Mary, put her hand on her shoulder, and ever so gently whispered in her ear, I wish you were my daughter. That's the God we have. In our messed up, in our brokenness, when everything we've done has failed, and we think that we are so beyond being loved, that even God himself couldn't love us. He whispers in our deaf ear, I wish you were my child. Because he wants you. He loves you. And he chases you. And he pursues you. He runs after you while you're running away from him. And he tells you, listen, I know. I get the pain you're in. I get everything you've gone through. I get all the stuff that's happened to you in your life. But here's the thing. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. You know what the world needs most? The world, what the world needs most is hope. I love the name of our church. It's New Hope because that's what the world really, really, really needs more than anything else. And here's why they need it. And here's why we need it. There is something that is innately built into the character and quality of us as human beings. And it is this. When we know, when we know that on the other side of whatever it is that we're going through, whatever horror we're experiencing right now, when we know that on the other side of that, that there is joy. On the other side of that, there is peace. On the other side of that, there is deliverance. On the other side of that, there is salvation. On the other side of that, there is hope. We can walk through any fire. We can go through any war. March through any hell. If we just know that there's hope, 
endure any suffering as long as we know that there's hope. And that is exactly what Jesus is giving his disciples. And it's exactly what he's giving us right here. It's hope. Hope that transcends our present circumstances. Hope that transcends our failures, our weakness, our self-image. Hope that transcends everything this world has to throw our way. Because in this world we'll have trouble. But I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us so many undeniable reasons to believe in who you are. And Lord, not just reasons to believe intellectually, Lord, but reasons to place our trust in you, our faith in you, to, to hand over control of our lives to you. Lord, help that belief as it grows in us, Lord. Help it to be real. Help it to be effectual. Not the kind of belief that merely uh, 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 acknowledges your existence, but the kind of belief that results in us trusting you with our lives. The kind that brings real change. Change in our, our thinking and change in our speech and change in our lifestyle, change in our plans, change in our perspective, change in our outlook, change in our behavior, change in our purposes. Thank you, Lord, that if we've truly given our lives to you, even in the trials and storms, in the times of fear and doubt, we know that even when we fail, even when we momentarily let go of your hand, Lord, you are holding on to us and you never let go. You've been right there. While we've been looking the other way and doubting ourselves and doubting you and running from you, Lord, you've been chasing us. You've been right there. And you're still right there. Thank you for that. And Lord, I pray especially for those who right now are going through storms in their life. Lord, please give them the faith to fully place their trust in you again. To believe the strength to weather the storm, knowing that you've given us hope for the future and a peace that passes understanding. Because no matter what this world throws at us, Lord, you have overcome the world. Thank you, Jesus.